what we're seeing now is the younger generations are actually you know, increasingly focused on, on climate change and the impact to them. And, and so there's now a demand from end consumers saying, well, this is the product I want. Energy doesn't just materialize out of the air, even with solar, right? At the end of the day, the, the solar panel needs to be built and the wires need to be laid and, um, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So th there is a physical world underlying this energy infrastructure that needs to be built. I think this uh, kind of perceptional, reputational risk, if I can call it that, um, is it's quite it's quite significant, especially now as you know a lot of the money, a lot of capital is becoming increasingly green. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the first of the Assay Live webinars for 2022. So this session is going to focus all on lessons from COP26, the road to COP27, the role of the mining industry, and more. So joining us today, we have Joseph Giacobelli, founder and managing partner for Asia Clean Tech Energy Investments. We have Sophie Liu, principal for Carbon Management Scope 3 at BHP and Nick Smith, Executive Director, Growth and Low Carbon Division for the Department of Energy and Mining for South Australia. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you. And um, so just a, a note to our audience today, we will be taking questions um, throughout the course of the, pa uh, the panel. Feel free to just type in any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and I will take it. Um, I will take it as 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 um, as as we can throughout the course of the panel. Um, and if we don't get to all of the questions during, then I will kind of keep track of them, and we can cover them elsewhere. Um, so yeah, so that's just in the Q and A box, please. Um, so to kick things off, last year's meetings um, for COP twenty six saw a lot of countries committing to further accelerating their decarbonization plans and strengthening emissions reduction targets ahead of the timeline set out in the Paris Agreement. And so with the accelerated phase out of fossil fuels, there is really an increased focus for the mining industry to grow the supply of the battery metals and others um, that help to make up renewable power and other sources of clean energy such as uranium and hydrogen. So those are some of the focuses that we're gonna to touch on today. So to kick things off, I wanted to ask our panelists, what were some of your main takeaways from the COP26 meetings? And um, do you think these goals are necessarily achievable? And what are some of the requisites to get us there? So maybe Joseph can um, kick us off there. Right, thank, thank, thanks a lot, Amy. Um, yeah, actually, uh, when COP26 was going on, um, there were quite a lot of questions around, you know, what's really the takeaways for Asia specifically. Um, so, you know, I guess my focus personally is on, uh, you know, Asia Pacific. So uh, I'll just talk about that. And I think there were two um, kind of takeaways. One is uh, a kind of renew or highlighted government commitments uh, around, around the region. I'm just, uh, I mean, obviously Australia came up with the 2050 uh, target, although uh, there's a lot of debate around what the target means, but still at least it's something better than better than we were, uh, better, better than it was. Um, and so there's the government commitment, which is really, really important for investors because it does give some you know, clarity and transparency in terms of long-term investments, because at the end of the day, energy is a long-term, uh, you know, when you invest in a, in a solar plant or a, in a wind farm, invest over over in twenty year period, right? So you got to you got to have some kind of transparency and consistency. Um, and the second thing is really additional and uh, uh, enlarged uh, financing channels. So we've seen you know an amount, a massive amount of money is available now for uh, renewable energy. Obviously, we can talk a little bit about uh, you know the profile of that money and what that money is thinking uh, seeking. Uh, later on. Uh, so in short, I reckon my personal takeaway is the government commitments renewed, which is really, really important for investment clarity. And secondly, is on the um, additional and enhanced uh, financing channels and uh, sources. Yeah, look, I, I tend to agree with you, uh, Joseph. I think, I think um, for me, the big takeaway from um, COP26 was, was really um, the ambition 
um, from from most countries around the world um, were starting to increase. And I think the the recognition um, of the importance of what 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 can be achieved and and the focus. Uh, I think COVID re- COVID nineteen really focused a lot of people on what could be done when when you do decarbonise. And I think so. There's been a lot of stimulus coming from from governments into into um, clean tech more broadly. And um, I think that that's that's the the impressive thing is that now you've got a lot of um, ESG focus from 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 the finance industry and and shareholders saying. What are we doing to help decarbonise, and how are we going to stay relevant into into the future? And I think that's the the, the takeaway from me from COP26 is that you've now got a lot of industry saying we need to we need to adapt and we need to change um, so that we can stay relevant and our and our organisation can stay sustainable and profitable. Absolutely, I, think that- I would agree with both Joseph and Nick. Um, I think. For us, uh, specifically in the mining sector, for the global diversified miners, uh, the major lessons from COP26 would be three things, three new, tr- not new trends, but trends that are accelerating. Um, the first one is definitely what Nick mentioned, with this increased ambition and this acceleration of ambition, um, which is aligned with the acceleration of the problem, which is um, that emissions are still being emitted into the, um, into the climate um, at uh, accelerating rates. Um, therefore reducing the time that we have to uh, bring emissions down and still stay underneath of our temperature temperature outcomes that we've all agreed to. Um, So I do think that the mining sector is now very very aware of this need for an acceleration of all of our ambitions um, and is very focused on uh, essentially looking at you know, our operations and, and what can we realistically achieve um, and trying to, um, you know, increase our ambitions where possible. Uh, a second major thing I would say is um, the increasing focus away from necessarily decarbonizing the operations of just mining itself, but uh, actually the, uh, the emissions of our customers. So scope three emissions um, is probably the most um, uh, pre- present challenge, I would say, um, for the metals and mining industry um, going into this next uh, couple of years. Um, and it's a, it's a much larger scale of an issue, um, and it's going to be more difficult to manage because it's we are you know two or three degrees removed from the direct impact on those emissions. While we can work with our customers and our partners as much as we can and try to promote the development of technology or provide the products that would um, feed into lower emissions intensive processes. At the end of the day, um, it is outside of our um, sort of direct operational control. Sometimes outside of our investment purview, um, and a lot of times outside of our regulatory capabilities of managing. Uh, as well, considering that it it transcends national borders. Um, And then a third major theme, I think this will be probably the focus of COP27 going into the future is physical adaptation to climate. And for the mining sector where, you know, the physical footprint of our sector and our ability to maintain safety and health for our workers and our communities is always uh, foremost in our minds. Um, physical ad- adaptation to climate and ensuring that our operations uh, continue to um, operate smoothly and safely going into the future is going to be a major concern as well. It's interesting you bring up um, the uh, the scope three challenges uh, that large miners such as such as uh, BHP are facing. Do you see any concrete examples of how how those are being addressed right now? Um, well, I think all of the different um, mining companies are dealing with it at, at different um, uh, degrees and uh, working directly with their uh, customers and their partners to ex- essentially map out uh, different strategies and, and what's viable. Um, some of the challenges that we face, I think, particularly for the downstream sector in um, steel production, um, is that the conversations that currently dominate um, technology pathways for the carbonization of steel are more focused on um, technology pathways that are more available to maybe the European or American markets. Um, at the end of the day, particularly for mining companies that are um, Australian, um, you know, a, a very large portion of our customer base is in Asia and developing Asia for that matter. And developing Asia is on a different technology trajectory. They're on a different timeline for decarbonization and they face different constraints in terms of the system, systematic um, structural ability to, to shift. Um, and so we have to work with those realities, right? So we're working towards those expectations. We are um, um, taking a very um, uh, honest eye towards the trajectory of those emissions, but at the same time, we have to acknowledge that those constraints in the downstream is having as to how fast they can be transitioned. And it doesn't always map out nicely with those um, national or international um, um, trajectories that we see coming out of the IEA or other international organizations. Um, those we have to remember are global averages and don't always necessarily reflect regional realities. Yeah, absolutely. 
And, and, I, and I think I'd, I'd even add to that. I mean, I can, I can give you a concrete example of, of BHP being a fantastic. You know, they've signed a PPA in, uh, for Olympic Dam to supply uh, the majority of the power up there from renewables. And, and I think that, you know, a power purchase agreement that sort of looks to decarbonise, um, you know, the, the majority of their electricity supply is a fantastic step forward. Um, you know, and I, and I think that those are the sorts of things that, um, you know, we're seeing wind and solar now at a very cost competitive environment. Um, it's still a little bit more expensive when you start to firm it up. Um, but those are the sorts of those are the sorts of steps that, you know, they make economic sense. They make environmental sense. They, they tick a lot of boxes now. So we're starting to see that, you know, um, mining companies more broadly, there's a, there's a lot of interest around how do you decarbonise and, dis and move away from from um, diesel. Which is not easy because it's such a uh, an easy fuel to use, um, but uh, you know I think that that's where that technology um, becomes really important in terms of you know ha having a slightly higher risk appetite um, becomes really important, and, and and governments sort of need to play a role in terms of helping to create the the policy settings to s slightly sort of de-risk that um, even further. So I, I think there's a, there's a lot of really great work going along, um, globally in the, in the, uh, the mining industry more broadly in terms of looking at a whole range of options, knowing that there's a technology learning curve that needs to be, needs to be met. Absolutely. Yeah. The decarbonization trajectory for the scope one and two emissions of, of mining, um, does mean, um, lots of interesting opportunities for innovation and investment in the Australian market. So we're very excited for that. Um, and then I, I guess a smaller portion of scope three that maybe doesn't get talked about as much, um, but it's the, up, it's the portion of upstream scope three emissions, so the emissions related to our procurement, um, BHP has committed to uh, um, trying to accomplish net zero by 2050 in that segment. And that does mean working closely with our supplier partners here in Australia and Chile and other countries that we operate um, to essentially address uh, their supply chain emissions as well and our own supply chain emissions. Very similar to the way that our customers like, uh, for instance, Tesla, works with us to reduce their supply chain emissions. Interesting. Um, you know, you bring up a good point about, I suppose, the responsibility for managing um, managing these emissions. So. You know, who's, who's, whose role and responsibility really is it? So the role of government, um, financial institutions, the, the large miners, the junior miners, um, you know, uh, how are we kind of getting um, this energy transition underway? Who's taking responsibility? Who's kind of pushing these agendas forward? Um, and how do government re uh, regulations and all that comes associated with that um, kind of play into play into this. That's, I think that's that's a, that's that's a massive question. Um, <laughs> but, but I think at, well, at the end of the day, um, you, know, you know, in my view, it's 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 really an e ecosystem. Um, but the starting point, as we've seen, you know, out of Europe, as you've seen to some extent in Australia, especially in Australia at the state level. Um, is is government policy? You know, if, if you don't have government facilitation uh, towards you know the energy transformation, like you've had in China, like you've had in um, places like I don't know Singapore, um, then um, then you know it's going to be very 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 difficult for it to happen. So, uh, uh, and, and I think Australia is a really great example where you've got you know at least, you know, from, I'm, I'm based in Hong Kong, so I'm not based in, uh, not based in Sydney or Melbourne. Uh, and, you know, from here, uh, you know, the headline is really with the federal government and all the things that the federal government is not doing. Um, and, you know, the climate denying kind of, uh, kind of uh, headlines that, that, that we see. And then if you look at the kind of state, at the state level, there's an enormous amount of stuff happening, uh, as uh, Nick mentioned earlier. And, and that kind of, to me, I feel just makes me feel really sad because uh, actually Australia should be a template for what all our countries are doing, apart from the federal government, obviously. Um, but uh, I don't think it's very, um, it's kind of publicized um, in terms of, uh, of, you know, all of the efforts that have been made, all these uh, mega, mega projects, you know, uh, tens of gigawatt projects that are going on uh, in Western Australia and elsewhere. Um, yes, yeah, so I think, you know, government policy is really, really, the, the starting point. It's not actually going to be act to me, it's government policy coming first and then everything else following. Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, you're right, Joseph. I mean, 
having the having the ambition and setting the aim is is really critical to um, informing you know stakeholders whether they're um, you know consumers or, or resident uh, sorry industry um, on what the focus needs to be um, and I guess there's probably a bit of a carrot and a stick um, type approach for for government uh, you know it's not government's role to to f- fund all of this side of things but I think there's a role for government to play in in funding um, you know the gap between commerciality and technology um, development um, in, in, in part. I think industry also needs to bear some of that as well. Um, but I, I think what we're seeing now is the younger generations are actually you know, increasingly focused on, on climate change and the impact to them. And, and so there's now a demand from end consumers saying, well, this is the product I want. Um, so it's, it, as you say, it's an ecosystem. There's, it's a, there's a responsibility and a, uh, and a push-pull sort of scenario for, for the whole of the economy to transition there. Um, and, and I think, you know, you're right about the states. I mean, there's been, you know, fantastic um, work done, you know, and I guess, you know, South Australia, we, we transitioned our last coal-fired uh, power station shut down in 2016. Um, and, and we've gone from 1% uh, renewables in 15 years to 62.5% in the last financial year. So there's enormous amount of work that's been happening and an enormous amount of knowledge that's been gained in terms of how do you integrate you know um, clean energy into an, an economy uh, and maintain the system security and the benefits that the whole of society actually really deserves and I think you know how do, how do you then take those those um, that clean energy and and encourage industry to, and and you know deal with uh, Sophie's sort of area of scope three how do you actually help other countries and and how how do you help other organizations to achieve their net zero 2050 ambitions you know I think that that's the uh, that's the challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I totally agree with your point. I don't think, uh, you know, we, we would expect uh, would expect governments to go out and just, you know, fund everything. Um, that, that's absolutely not what uh, what I was referring to, but it's more, you know, whether the policy is, is clear and transparent because that, that also impacts on your cost of capital. So these uh, uncertainties emanating from Canberra have actually increased your cost of capital, some of the investments in renewables in Australia. And that's damaging for the development of, you know, the energy transition. Uh, where in other places where you, you know, again, take Singapore or, or you know, China in its own very kind of crazy and funky ways, um, you know, there's a little bit more certainty as, you know, where, where, where things are going. Not smooth, it's not a smooth road, but at least there's a little bit more certainty. And that doesn't impact your, uh, your cost of capital. Um, and we've seen that very, very clearly in Europe now because the kind of EU push. So that's really the angle I was coming from. And it's great that you get this, you know, this, uh, this kind of push from, from states, from the individual states in Australia. But again, if you don't have, you know, the federal government coming through and then being saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're good with this, uh, we're, we're, you know, we endorse this, then that really helps on at least, you know, in financing front is just one of the many examples. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, another part of our experience that we, um, that is probably something that both the federal and the state governments will have uh, more of a role to play going forward is um, establishing and streamlining some of the standards by which we can be measuring the success and accomplishments of the decarbonization, um, whether it be uh, around questions around certification of offsets or carbon credits, um, or even streamlining with international standards around what can be recognized and what shouldn't be recognized in cross-border transactions related to uh, carbon transfer. Uh, these are issues that um, are uh, very first, uh, uh, front, front in mind for international companies for multinational Australian based uh, that do need, I think, a degree of uh, government um, uh, interaction and involvement by, uh, in order for us to have a, a proper uh, footing when discussing with our, with our trade partners is probably one issue that I would highlight that is you know, something that's going to be needed more in the future. Um, going back to Amy's question about you know, what is the responsibility of climate change and decarbonization, I would actually reframe that. I don't think it's a, it's a question of responsibility for the mining sector. It's a question of opportunity. Um, and that is both for our SWIFT 22 as well as SWIFT 3. So it's really about um, how do we uh, streamline our operations so that not only are we reducing our um, um, carbon intensity, but we are potentially reducing the future cost of our operations, potentially um, improving the health and safety of the working environment for our, um, for our employees. 
um, and uh, also the environment for our community. So there's a lot of knock-on benefits for some of the things that we consider in decarbonization. There's also some add-on um, add costs as well, or potential sort of negative outcomes for things um, that we didn't necessarily anticipate. So we have to weigh all those against each other. And then within scope three, you know, there is a question of, are we actually responsible for the emissions of our customers? Um, instead of talking about that, it's really much more about how do we, uh, you know, shift the portfolio and the uh, product mix uh, to meet the, need, the evolving needs of our customers. You know, how many um, sectors can say, uh, you know, that their customers have given them a 30 year leave notice on uh, what it is that they wish to buy one day. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's, it's in a lot of ways, um, a certain amount of foresight that's actually very useful. Um, and it's really about uh, redeveloping um, your plans and, and streamlining in order to uh, account for the potential of that evolution and the demand and, and knowing where to go in the future for that opportunity. Great. So, um, you know, part of this energy transition, it requires a, a, an incredible amount of new metal supply to help with the build out of, of renewables and batteries um, and all of the associated new energy sources. So um, how, I mean, my question was, what role the responsibility does the mining industry have to ensure the supply? But also, I suppose, how does the financial um, financial institutions as well as government kind of play into uh, the growth of the mining industry um, and, and help to kind of spur on more exploration and stuff to ensure that we have the supply that we need to, to meet future demand? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really good question, isn't it? Um, I mean, demand will automatically um, push explorers into into finding new um, new areas. Um, if, you know, if there's if there's solid demand and and, and the price is right, um, you know. But I think that that's um, you know some of the stuff that we've done in South Australia over the you know the last few years has really been to co-invest with industry around exploration. Um, through accelerating the the discovery of, of those um, those areas and, and and new new resources that are actually com competitive and and then I think the question is how does government reduce the red and green tape to go from discovery to operation in a in a much faster rate because I think that's the sort of thing that we need to do to try and reduce the cost of, of mining and, and improve the the uh, availability of these new minerals because the reality is is that as as we electrify more we're actually going to need more we're going to need a whole heap more of, of different types of metals that that we haven't really had to uh, produce as much of and and I think that that's the sort of thing where you know fast, nimble, certainty, transparency, so that you can bring all of the stakeholders along becomes really, really important. Um, so government needs to be constantly looking at um, how do we engage with stakeholders to make sure that everyone's on, coming along on the journey, but also how do, what can we do better in terms of, you know, can we can we use automation of some processes to, uh, to make it easier for, for customers to engage with? with us you know it's, it's about learning those sorts of things and and you know um defining pathways a little bit better through regulation and those sorts of things can can often make life a lot easier um for everyone because it creates that transparency certainty and and um reduced risk um of, of operating in a in a, in a jurisdiction yeah, i think the, the the kind of public private cooperation collaboration is absolutely Essentially, if you look at, I mean, uh, again, to go to go on about Australia, I mean, I think Australia has done a really, really good job on uh, on, on that front. Uh, again, at the state level, I always like to put in the disclaimer. Um, and uh, but obviously, um, you know, and you've, and you've got some other places like uh, you know Singapore, where you actually have government and uh, stakeholders, uh, and even believe it or not, in China, actually the government does sit down with with the companies, both the public companies and the private companies. Um, to kind of collaborate and cooperate so that they're all kind of going the same pathway. And I think going forward, particularly with the kind of getting some of the new, newer technologies, getting the cost, the, the levelized cost of energy of those newer technologies like energy storage uh, or new, brand new energy storage technologies is really, really key to have that collaboration cooperation because it, re it reduces risks and, um, and nothing better than get people to kind of sit down around the table and talk, talk to each other. I would also, um, I think, 
I would, I would say that in the decarbonization narrative um, for investors and regulators and stakeholders um, that are um, advocating for the change, um, there needs to be a recognition that besides supporting um, new clean energy technologies, there needs to be a uh, more support for clean material uh, supply chains. Um, I, think, I think the next challenge that we face in the journey to decarbonization for climate tech is really having enough materials to make everything that we need to generate the energy that we need. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, right now, basically, the green finance community does not recognize metals and mining um, generally as, uh, as being a part of that uh, larger narrative. And they really do. Uh, that's the only way that we're going to have enough money directed at both the innovation and ventures uh, segment, the, the earlier stage that we need to be developing the new technologies, as well as uh, supporting the capital raising of the uh, medium to large size mining companies and metals producers that need to be, uh, that need to be <clears throat> essentially developing supply chains. So I think there needs to be a transition in the green investment community and a recognition that there is um, an argument to be made that green financing should be, um, should be for the mining and the metals uh, uh, production sector as well. Um, and then I think maybe another, uh, another major role for the mining sector uh, in decarbonization uh, sort of going forward is this uh, balance between um, the needs of, uh, and this maybe goes to your next question, Amy, around uh, ESG requirements for mining and just this help to uh, support the development of, uh, of um, low uh, of critical minerals for decarbonization or does it sort of uh, uh, impede it? I, I don't, I think that, um, you know, great operators uh, should be able to live up to, uh, you know, all of those sort of standards that we, we set for ourselves for ESG. Um, and so it's not that it would um, impede the ability to produce critical minerals, but at the same time, there perhaps needs to be a recognition that, um, energy doesn't just materialize out of the air, even with solar, right? At the end of the day, the, the solar panel needs to be built and the wires need to be laid and, um, and uh, all that kind of stuff. So th there is a physical world um, underlying this energy infrastructure that needs to be built. Um, and there needs to be capital uh, and regulatory approvals that will move these projects forward. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you bring up a really good point about, you know, the recognition from the green finance community and understanding the role of the mining industry um, in the energy transition. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it does lead well into my next question, which was really, you know, asking, do you see ESG expectations from the uh, financial community helping or hindering the future growth of supply that's needed to grow new energy systems? So, you know, we can look at kind of how societal um, understanding um, of the role of mining and the good versus harm that it causes. I think there's, um, you know, how misunderstood is the mining industry still um, with regards to energy transition and the build out of, um, you know, renewables and batteries and all of that. Well, um, I'm not sure if it's misunderstood. The, mi the mining sector is definitely um, very focused on um, the decarbonization um, trajectory and, and has, has been for, for years now um, across you know, small to medium to large um, uh, operators. I, I think there's, there's a more of, of a challenge of balancing out the different requirements of ESG needs um, because it's also societal, um, non-carbon related environments, health and safety, and governance issues. Um, so, you know, in the search for enough critical minerals in the world, um, does that drive us into uh, harder to um, operate markets? Uh, that's one of the key questions that we, we do have to deal with. And there's a question of, um, is that, you know, do our investors and shareholders have a high enough risk appetite in the that as well? Um, do Australian mining companies, um, you know, uh, have, the, have the appetite to, to, to sort of scale up and put it at that, uh, in, into markets where, more of the material might be available, but the operating um, environment might be different. Um, so there's there's these kind of trade-offs that um, we will you know encounter, and um, not only will we as an operator have to make those decisions, but our shareholders and the regulators that uh, govern us will have to make those kinds of trade-offs and, and decisions as well. So those are those are things that um, are experienced in every market, including Europe. You know. With, with what's been happening recently as well, things, things like that, just, you know, it's everything is subject to local politics. Um, uh, but then um, I would say another issue is, um, particularly with the decarbonization uh, benchmarks that are out there, 
in terms of the international investors and, and what they're um, trying to um, incentivize in terms of the behavior of multinationals. Um, there's a lot of focus on target setting. There's a lot of focus on modeling your trajectory. There's a lot of focus on 2050, but not enough focus on what's actually happening in the near term and on uh, rewarding physical actions. Um, so uh, rather than just simply talking about decarbonization, actually doing decarbonization. Um, and uh, I think there, there does need to be, eventually we need to get past that stage of um, always sort of making long-term promises and really more focusing on actually benchmarking you know, near-term behavior. Uh, we're really at that stage now of decarbonization where the near-term emissions abatement is probably way more important than what we could potentially remove from the environment in the future. Um, that's probably that, another sort of uh, constraint right now that we face, which is, you know, it's, it's very difficult to make promises about things 30 years from now, but, you know, we can focus on the things that we can do in the next five years. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that, yeah, so if you made, you made a whole bunch of re really great points, uh, including the one about the kind of short term. And I think one of the things that has happened um, roughly around COP26, a little bit before then, and definitely afterwards is, you know, corporates coming up with their net, net zero strategies. And uh, you see that a lot of the more, you can really tell which one of the more realistic uh, corporates coming up with the shorter term targets, um, like, you know, taking one, one, amongst millions of examples is uh, a very small uh, $1 billion market cap uh, Chinese gas supplier, uh, gas distributor in China called Tianwen Gas um, that, that I'm sure you know. And then they've just come up with a kind of reasonably realistic, just three year um, renewed strategy on what they're gonna do about you know, net zero. Um, and that's really the beginning of the company basically shifting the whole business. Um, so that's this is one example of, you know, amongst, again, millions of examples, but some companies coming up with the short term and equity investors or credit investors are really, really focused on that um, because at the end of the day, they want to know, you know, what, what can you do? What, what actually are you capable to do, to do today? And then the second uh, really great point that you made is, you know, between now and 2050, Obviously, there's people like, you know, the, the federal government in Australia, which thinks that it's going to be this kind of new magic uh, clean technology. It's going to come out of the air. It's going to be really cheap and efficient, and it's going to decarbonize Australia. Uh, but uh, in, in the world of reality, um, you know, there are a lot of things that can happen. For example, you know, the role of uh, energy storage, right? I mean, if we, we, there's a lot of people coming up with new solutions, uh, uh, new, uh, new, new, new technology, energy to storage technologies. Uh, and, you know, how efficient will they be? Uh, what's the cost curve? Will the, will, if, they, if these, uh, say, for example, an hypothetical example, and I'm not sure if you agree, Safi, if, uh, you know, we come up with a brand new energy storage solution uh, out of China, and because China is producing, uh, is installing you know, tens of gigawatts of, of renewable energy every year, uh, they're going to have economies of scale to bring down the uh, levelized cost of energy of that energy storage, then everybody benefits. That's one hypothetical scenario. But again, it's stuff that, you know, it's going to happen in the next 30 years and we don't really know. So uh, yeah, just uh, pinching in, pitching into uh, what, uh, what you said. Look, I think it's it's a really um, you you you've both made really good points, and and I think you know um, there's a lot of money that's keen to be associated with clean tech, um, and you know energy storage becomes really important. You know, decarbonised gas becomes really important, um, and I, and I think you know it, it's a I sort of liken um, energy the energy portfolio a little bit like a transport fleet you know the the battery the big battery that we installed you know the tesla big battery that we you know, 100 megawatts that we installed a few years ago um you know it's sort of like a ferrari it's it's fast it's quick it, it does sort of certain things but it's it's no good for operating past more than sort of four or five hours um so you need that sort of you need that sort of multi uh platform scenario to de-risk your your economy and that creates that certainty requirement and i think you know what Sophie said about um, you know green finance not necessarily looking at mining, and I think it that's a that's a reputational issue where some people um, just are fundamentally are opposed to mining, um, even though it underpins the vast majority of our economy. So I think actually you know as we you know in South in Australia we have you know 
trillions of dollars in superannuation funds um, that are looking for investment, uh, you know, investors um, investment criteria. And I think, you know, increasingly um, their, their shareholders are saying, well, we want it focused on, on, you know, environmentally sustainable, um, clean, um, because this is our, this is our future. Um, so actually finding the economic opportunities and, and looking at, um, you know, the mining sector more broadly and saying, we're going to need lots of this stuff. We might as well tip some money into this to try and help them achieve their goals of decarbonising is, is really important. And I think that that's the sort of finance that actually helps trying to, trying to bring some of that technology readiness forward further on, along the curve. Yeah. I think the, the, especially okay, from, from, from the kind of investor perspective, uh, perception is everything. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of, I mean, you know, if you hear of oh, VHP is building a solar, a, a solar plant, you're going, really? Um, because it's not, it's, not, it's not a natural extension. But then, you know, companies like VHP have done a really, really good job of explaining why, how. Um, but that's not the case for a, a lot of the mining, in all mining companies. So I think this uh, kind of perceptional, reputational risk, if I can call it that, um, is is quite it's quite significant, especially now as you know a lot of the money, a lot of capital is becoming increasingly green. So um, and and you know how are you going to be refinancing a mine if that mine has got a reputation of uh, it's got a if mining in general has got a negative reputation. And the other thing is also when it comes back to education, um, and it's pretty close to my heart. There's there's a lot of misunderstanding about. The whole clean energy thing about mining in general, uh, you know, and some people maybe understand a portion of it. Um, and so, when it comes to like banks, um, you know, there's not an enormous amount of green expertise in banks, investment banks, especially as we speak today, as probably uh, Sophie will agree. Um, it's improving; it's better than where it was. But so, so even the lenders, so the investors are not, you know, 100% there yet. The, the lenders are not 100 percent there yet um, so there's still an enormous amount of kind of education that uh, needs to be uh, needs to be I don't, think, I, don't, I don't know if you agree so if you know that you spoke a lot to uh, to banks before but uh, I still think that there's a, there's a little bit of a lag yeah um, there's a, there's a decent amount of education um, and about um, what the decarbonization trajectory would look like in material supply chains. Um, and then for diversified mining, um, there's a lack of understanding that there's actually, uh, there's not a single diversified miner that shares a similar profile as another one. Um, there's no two alike. It's very unlike oil and gas companies in that sense. Um, and uh, a lot of the frameworks in which our investors and um, uh, lenders and, and other sort of major stakeholders um, try to understand the mining sector from is through the same lens as the oil and gas sector. Uh, but unfortunately, um, it's it's a little bit of trying to fit a circle into a square, um, or a square into a circle, whichever direction you want to go. Um, and so it, it, there is um, a degree of um, of cross education and, and learning that we're doing together with our external stakeholders um, to be able to develop better metrics um, and also develop uh, more um, streamlined expectations and trajectories of decarbonization that would that would fit you know the needs of the mining sector because we're all. Uh, so unique and diversified depending on, literally diversified is the name of our sector, <laughs> uh, depending on the portfolio of materials that we happen to produce. So. I think I think just the, probably the only other thing that it, that sort of really sort of, you know, when we talk about 2050 net zero, um, that means that we're still emitting. Um, it's just that we, you know, there's some there's some technology there, there's some technology that's going to just be very very difficult to decarbonise. And I think you know the cement industry is a really good example of that. Um, you know, it, when you when you're creating um, you know cement, you're producing CO2 effectively. Um, so you know the, the investment in technology that will capture and abate and and mitigate. I think that that also becomes really important. And I think um, you know green finance needs to needs to be across that. And direct air captures an opportunity. Um, you know carbon sequestration, uh, blue carbon, those sorts of things become really important in terms of um, offsetting the emissions that we're still going to produce. Because the reality is is that oil and gas is not going anywhere for the next 20, 30 years. We need it as a as an economy. Um, and so we need to be smart in terms of how we actually um, deal with the more challenging 
less sexy um, type of type of issues, I think is 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 um, yeah, that's important for the industry. Yeah, I I three hundred percent agree. I think, and again, that comes back to that education issue where um, you know there's still a lot of uh, misunderstandings about what the energy trans- transition actually is all about and what it involves. Um, I think the the positive trend, um, and going back to the very, to, to Amy's first question about COP twenty six, is that you know we're I mean the train has already left the station, um, and and I think COP twenty six kind of confirmed that um, at least on the finance front, on the kind of uh, in investors front, especially equity and credit investors, um, it's you know it's very 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 clear that now it's not just BlackRock, um, you know looking at um, kind of uh, green uh, green investments and sustainable investments, et cetera. But, you know, all the other fund managers are coming, coming again. I think another big group, uh, Vanguard, uh, just a couple of days ago, um, also kind of changed their tune, so to speak. So the trend has really left the station. That's good news. The money is becoming increasingly green. That's good news. The technologies, you know, and newer technologies are all available. They just need to be kind of de-risked and ramped up. So that's positive as well. Um, and then companies like, you know, service company are doing, you know, great job at um, kind of doing this kind of stakeholder and shareholder engagement uh, on the, in the education front. So all of that kind of makes me relatively positive and optimistic. So um, my next question was really looking at um, kind of the, the role of or emissions reductions in mining operations themselves. So at the mining level, looking at kind of how, how can we decarbonize and bring more renewables on site? And we have a question from the audience, um, kind of looking at the cost, cost difference. I'm, I'm not sure if that's easy, easily measured between renewables and um, in terms of storage, but, but really looking at, um, How can we get more miners on board with adopting renewable power and renewable storage um, into their operations? And I don't know if that's different depending on the size of miner, if it's easier or I suppose more difficult for the larger miners versus the juniors. Um, I mean, I'll speak a little bit without going into numbers specifically. Um, It's very much uh, site dependent. Um, And then uh, the reason why it's site dependent is because it depends on the degree of of operational um, energy intensity that you have at specific sites and then whether or not it's connected to the grid or if it's more remote. Um, So it's not it's not always related to the scale of it per se, as much as it's related to, um, sometimes it's related to, you know, how, how much activity do you have at a specific site and how, how like what's the distance that it's spread out over and how far away from um, other sort of balancing solutions uh, that you may have. The original question, I believe it was from Rod Adams was about renewable energy plus storage and the price differentials. Um, not speaking from a B, uh, BHP perspective, but speaking from my, my previous experience as a clean energy analyst, um, uh, what we had uh, found was that uh, the proportional um, sort of added on capital costs of um, a battery uh, to a renewable energy uh, storage, uh, re- renewable energy um, installation on site at the mine. Uh, is really sort of dependent on the size of the storage, right? So are you sizing for 100% one-on-one match to the um, to your generation capabilities or are you, are you doing more a three-to-one um, or a two-to-one? Um, and um, there was a sort of diminishing returns for every additional, um, uh, uh, every additional um, kilowatt of, um, of kilowatt hour of storage capacity that you were adding to that, to that site. Um, so it's, and there's, there was a lot of efficiency gains in terms of um, doing coupled pairing of wind and solar as uh, in order to sort of match the generation profiles um, and then um, sort of doing additive storage on top of that. Uh, so it, it's, it, it's, it's very site dependent, but it's not um, generally what we found, at least given the current constraints of the, um, of, of, the um, of most mining um, sites, 
uh, reaching 100% um, electrification and 100% displacement with renewable energy plus storage at mine sites is not physically possible right now, uh, let alone even getting into the commercial conversation about it, uh, the, the economics of it. And then um, a lot of the economics look pretty favorable, you know, from, um, I would say the 2025 to 2030 segment um, in, in terms of um, getting really close to that 100% displacement. Um, but there are uh, other non-energy related capital costs that you have to consider in terms of the amount of equipment on the mine sites related to switching drivetrain, related to um, uh, pulley systems. I and mean, there's, there's a gazillion different things you need to be considering um, since not all energy consumption at the mine sites are electrified by or, or, using, or even easily uh, electrifiable. Um, and some of the modeling that we've looked at, uh, at the end of the day, there are going to be uh, certain percentages of our operations that are going to be hard to evade, um, that electrification just isn't going to uh, do it. And in that sense, we'll, we'll have to be looking at other, uh, other options, um, but that's further down the line. Yeah, I hope that helps to answer the question. Yeah, that was uh, uh, quite interesting. Thank you. We also had a few questions um, in advance from the audience, as well as one now, um, looking at the role of nuclear and uranium. Um, I mean, it, it, we've just put out, for the assay, we, we've just put out, um, or we are putting out today, our first uranium edition. So, I mean, it is kind of quite topical right now um, as a, kind of a, a key source for um, clean energy. Do we see uh, further investment or interest um, in this sector? Uh, look, I think, you know, what, um, and Joseph, jump in whenever you're ready. Um, from, from my perspective, you know, um, there's some discussion, you know, globally around, um, you know, the, the move away from coal and the baseload power required to support some economies and, and that nuclear is, is an alternative opportunity for that. Um, you know, in, in, South, in South Australia, I think we've got a quarter of the world's uranium resources. So, um, you know, we're, we're quite open to, um, you know, the, the nuclear industry. But I, I think that the, from, a, from a regulator's perspective, you know, the, the, the proof is in the new technology and, and getting smaller modular reactors into the marketplace. And I think that's the sort of thing where we're already seeing it now with, um, you know, with the move to renewables that um, baseload power and coal-fired power stations are struggling to, to compete in Australia because um, they, they just aren't flexible enough and they're not able to produce it at the same price point. So having, having that firming generation, which, you know, nuclear um, can play, you know, flex up and down a little bit more, um, or, you know, that, that's the sort of thing that can, you know, produce, you know, hydrogen, um, which you can then perhaps take with, you know, direct air captured CO2 and produce, you know, some of the products that the mining industry needs, at least it's carbon neutral um, or, you know, uh, position when it's, when it's burned. So um, I think, I think nuclear is, um, it's definitely something to watch uh, more broad. You know, and I think, you know, um, Joseph, I think you've probably got some good experience around this as well. Yeah, I, I guess I can look at it more from the, uh, from the demand side of things um, and, you know, what, what the electric power generators and what countries are doing. And, Obviously, as you know, I mean, again, sticking just to Asia uh, and skipping all the other countries around the world, just as an example, uh, you know, you still got China, which is going uh, very, very aggressively uh, towards uh, more nuclear. And I mean, they had about 50 gigawatts at the end of 2020. They're looking at 75 gigawatts by uh, 2025. And then the number beyond that can be anywhere between probably 100, 150 by 2035 or so. Um, the next step up is really got to do with whether they feel that the newer generation uh, reactors are safe enough um, so that they can actually start putting some nuclear power plants inland because uh, right now they're all in coastal provinces. So, and so the kind of the delta can be that China by 2050 could have anything between 150 gigawatts to as much as 500 gigawatts, some experts believe, uh, which would be obviously, you know, a little bit exaggerated in my view, but anything is possible in this world. Um, so, so the upside is, 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 quite, is quite significant. The other side of it is that if um, they can work out, you know, very uh, effective and efficient and, and very, very safe uh, reactors 
than some countries around Asia, which have been kind of um, in kind of, they like nuclear, but they don't dare. They would like to do a little bit more places like uh, Indonesia, uh, for example, or uh, Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, so you could potentially see some upside, but right now, at least on the demand side, it's got to do with, um, with you know, whether the new generation of reactors is going to be safe or not. And I'm not even talking about the politics and the social side of things, you know, whether people like nuclear or don't like nuclear. And you see some countries kind of going, uh, complete changing their view, uh, like Korea, which was pretty aggressive on nuclear, but then decided to... Uh, to uh, not build as much nuclear as we were planning to. So uh, on the demand side, there's still, you know, uh, so the politics, political side is still over in 70, but uh, China alone could be, you know, a massive, massive um, user of, uh, of uranium, obviously, uh, depending again. But that's probably something in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then on your point about the cost side, which I think is really, really key, um, well, you could find some kind of market mechanisms so that you kind of pay for your base load in some way, you know, capacity charge or something like that. So there could be some mechanisms which could be uh, could be uh, could be put in. But I mean, I personally, um, I like nuclear. I'm pro. Sorry, but I'm pro nuclear um, as long as it's safe and it's transparent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, yeah, that's just that's, that's my my two pennies worth. And I think that yeah, I think yeah, um, you know, we had a presentation from a consultancy firm um, a couple of months ago that was talking about the different reactor technologies. Um, some of the reactor technologies now, you know, looking at producing a waste stream that's got a, a radioactive half life of 30, 40 years, and I think that's um, you know that's a bit of a game changer in terms of how do you deal with waste, uh, nuclear waste. Um, I mean, if you can bring something back to a 30, 40 year half-life, um, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a much smaller waste stream, it's a, less, a much less difficult um, waste stream to deal with, then I think you, you get a social um, license to, to, you know, look at nuclear in a, in a broader te context. And I think that's the, that's the other opportunity that's there. So um, I think there's been a lot of really interesting points that have been put out um, over the course of the last hour. Um, to close things off, I just wanted to ask our panelists, um, you know, the second half of the title was The Road to COP27. So um, I suppose thoughts for the next year. So looking short term, do you see kind of interesting policies, um, any, any significant shifts um, or, or actions um, as, as we progress throughout the year. I might start off. Um, there's some really interesting energy politics playing out in Europe right now, and Europe tends to be a bit of a bellwether for where the conversation is going to go um, with um, climate and what's recognized as uh, viable climate technology pathways and, and things like that. The, the raging debate about um, whether or not gas is categorized as um, as a as a as a as a clean, as a clean energy um, source or a transition energy source is going to be really interesting. I think um, a lot of people in Australia are watching that very closely. Um, but beyond the conversation around uh, whether or not gas would be classified, um, I think for a lot of mining companies around the world, particularly Australian mining companies, uh, we're very keen to see um, how the European taxonomy is going to develop um, around the green materials. Um, and the recognition of the critical minerals that go into that, um, as well as um, how you're going to benchmark, uh, you know, intensity for uh, more traditional industrial metals like aluminum and uh, steel. The conversation in Europe is um, very understandably dominated by a couple of companies um, that are operating strictly in the European American sphere. Um, but that conversation is eventually going to have to expand. The European taxonomy does not exist in a, in a, in a vacuum. Um, it's going to have to engage with the remaining three quarters of the uh, global steel industry. Uh, so as, well, as much as the European taxonomy can say a couple of things about the steel sector, at the end of the day, um, nothing's gonna happen in steel decarbonization until China and India say something. And they have yet uh, to establish exactly what is their preferred pathway. And obviously they're dealing with a very different timeline. So I would say in the next year or so, we're, we're watching that very closely. Um, there's a lot of engagement in the Chinese government right now with their national steel companies 
to essentially map out what is a realistic scale decarbonization um, industry decarbonization trajectory for them. Great. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, from, from my perspective, there's there's a lot of projects um, currently on the road um, to to delivering decarbonisation. So I actually think, you know, one of the key things is to actually get some implementation um, and get some of these at scale developments that can, can start to inform, uh, you know, global economies around what's the price point, what's the learnings, how do you share that information um, and, and give financiers confidence, give regulators confidence, you know, give give communities confidence, because I think, um, you know, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of projects being slated at gigawatt scale, it's, it's about how do you get the supply chain to support the, um, the ambitions of, of the rest of the world. And I think those are the things that really need to, um, you know, implementation of this is, as Sophie said, we've got to drag this forward. Um, and I think that that's the sort of key thing that we need to be looking at. And I think that's where there will be a bit more focus as well. Yeah, from my side, I think Sophie and Nick, um, you know, covered covered pretty much all. Uh, I guess the the one thing is with regards to uh, to reporting, sustainability reporting. So uh, you know, the to me, the at the end of the day, finance is absolutely the uh, the foundation of everything. I mean, if you don't if you don't have the money, you can't do it. You basically, you can't invest in the projects. Um, so. Uh, you know, coming up with uh, with standards and the uh, you know there's there's the international sustainability uh, board. Um, uh, you know, you've got international uh, financial standards, and now we're going to have international sustainability standards. And um, you see some of the bigger countries like China. Uh, there's a little bit of a rapprochement in terms of uh, definitions, at least with uh, with the Europeans. So once they agree. Then you know, hopefully, some other countries will, will get on board as well. So once we all agree on not just what is green, but also what, what is brown, because um, that's still kind of fuzzy logic at, the, at this stage. Um, so the definitions is actually quite uh, may sound boring, but it's actually quite essential uh, sustainability, so that then companies can do the reporting in a little bit more of an effective and efficient way, and um, investors actually know what's. What's going on? Because at the end of the day, you know that educate the whole education discussion we had earlier. Um, it's also happening with investors. You know, all of a sudden, um, imagine you're a you're a hedge fund who's long who's doing long and short. Uh, so you think, okay, I'll short oil and um, buy um, renewables, and then they fork out, hold on, but I can't invest in oil. So, so how does that work? So there's there's, there's a few. There's a few things which you kind of have to uh, kind of realize that uh, the definitions are quite, quite, quite important. Absolutely. Um, well, I think maybe we can uh, regroup in a year and see how see how we've progressed and see see how things are are, are shaping up. Um, with all of this, there's certainly a lot to uh, I suppose keep an eye on and look forward to. So um, that really brings us to the hour. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, for taking part today and our audience uh, for asking questions. Since we will be distributing the video in the next couple of days, the recording. Um, but yeah, thanks for taking part in this webinar. And we look forward to seeing everyone at a live event um, sometime in the, in the near future. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Sophie. Thank Bye. you. Cheers.